folks. Let's continue with mass. Uh, more chemistry today, and in particular the kind of chemistry that refers to the laboratory practices. That second years have done already, and the first years will do shortly. Um, specifically, the aspect of those practices that deal with the data processing. You have all seen the situations where you have to plot something on the millimeter of paper, then draw a straight line through it, and then determine some parameters of the You also know that you can do it on a computer, and uh, it stands to reason that the computer doesn't actually require to draw a line on a millimeter of paper inside it. So the computer does something deterministic and well defined. It draws the straight lines for your points. And today is about what exactly it does and how and how we can do that when you are, for example, programming your own software. So I will begin with the chemical context. Uh, imagine that you are trying to determine a concentration of sunlight absorbing substance, copper sulfate, um, some protein uh, in the presence of inhydrin and so on, spectrophotometry. So what a spectrophotometer is, it is a light source that emits light at certain carefully controlled wavelengths. The light flies into a pivot, which has a concentration of a sample. More specifically, it has some concentration. Uh, each substance is unique in how strongly it absorbs light, so it has something called the extinction coefficient. And then, of course, the longer the cuvet, the more light is going to be absorbed in it, so the length of the cuvet also matters. Whatever exit that exits the cuvet flies into a detector that receives the intensity, compares it to the original intensity, or broadly speaking, uh, digitizes, and on it goes into a computer for processing. If we look at how light gets absorbed by a substance, you can say that, okay, the amount of light that has been absorbed per unit length of that cubet, well, because the light intensity is decreasing, this rate has to be negative, it has to be proportional to concentration. It has to be proportional to how strongly the light absorbs. It has to be proportional to the original amount there was. The more light there had been, the more will get absorbed per unit length. So, so what you have here is called a differential equation. We will get to those in due course. Uh, what I will simply do now is I will write the solution for this and I will then demonstrate that this is in fact a solution. So after the mathematics that we will cover at some point in this module, uh, we get W of L is W not the intensity that has flown in, that's the intensity that came out, E minus C epsilon <coughs> So if it is an exponential attenuation. What people normally do, however, is to formulate the law for how light is absorbed. Um, that is the laws of this, and it is slightly um, easier to use in that way. So we will divide this by W0, and we will take the logs of log sum. So we will is E minus C. <coughs> Taking the logs on both sides, log is E minus C epsilon L. And then to get rid of that minus, I will just flip around that content of the log. Now this is called absorption. 
the amount of light originally relative to the amount of light that uh, got transmitted. Uh, and you can see that this quantity is proportional to concentration. Now, often, for convenience, it is instead the decimal law that is used here, uh, rather than the natural one. But the pertinent thing is that the log of this measurement is proportional to concentration. And epsilon is a fundamental constant, and L is something that you know from the geometry. It is true. What does this mean in practice? So let's say we have absorbance. Okay as a function of concentration. For any given substance, it is actually quite easy to prepare a series of standard solutions. For well, measuring the concentration of copper, 2 plus, well, you can just order some copper sulfate from sigma Aldrich and prepare a series of carefully controlled concentrations. So you would have some of them here. Then you put those concentrations into the qubit and you measure the corresponding and this is called your calibration set. We can then draw a straight line through this. It will either hit the zero exactly or will be pretty close to zero because there is no um, intercept term here. So we draw the line through this. So this is A. where k is the proportionality coefficient, so this is called calibration. And then, if we take an unknown solution, then, and measure it on the wavelengths where only copper absorbs, we will measure some concentration here. Our a question mark of the unknown solution, and then we can use this calibration curve to get amount, C question mark, that is the concentration of copper in our unknown solution. And this is how it proceeds. And the second years have seen this and done this many times. Oh, I imagine the first years will soon do or have done it already. This is very trivial. We are longer as well. It's better Notice, however, that there's a significant mathematical stage here. This function here is some general linear function. So let's say y equals a x plus b. And x is our concentration, and a is our bunch of constants in here. And potentially, if the qubit's a bit old uh, and absorbs the light by itself, there will be a constant shift corresponding to the absorbance of the instrument itself. So we are dealing with a generic line like this. Well, how do we actually extract the A and the B? Well, you can all done it at school. Simplified way. B is the little, so let's say we draw another curve in here, so perhaps some different set of data points. Then B is this intercept, and it is when the uh, primary variable is zero. And the slope is determined uh, using the following simplified formula. So A is actually, you can do it uh, exactly in here. If we take dy by dx, dx, or approximately delta y over delta x. Remember what I told you about the limits ages ago. And if we take some increment of x, delta here or delta C if it's specifically concentration, it could be something else like time. Uh, then we will have the corresponding delta Y. And we can just pick a delta X if we like to find the corresponding delta Y and do it. For linear curves, this is actually exactly so even an approximation. What this is, however, is uh, an arduous manual <coughs> process. Imagine an industrial situation where you have to do things like that, concentration estimation, um, perhaps a thousand times per second. You put a flow through reactors that does some really rapid chemical transformation, you need to have accuracy control in real time. And so there will be a spectrophotometer on the outflow that will be running these things many times per second. 
you're dealing with radioactive decay, it's probably not a good idea to have a human sitting next to it with a ruler and a millimeter of paper, right? You do need this automated. And of course, all of this, in case a human does it, I've seen countless times the students coming up with concentrations that are typical of a neutron star uh, and handing in those results um, without uh, a second thought, right? Uh, so the bond length is longer than the size of the solar system and so on. Uh, humans make errors. So we need a reliable automatic procedure to do exactly this. So let us formalize this process. What we have is a data set. Y and this is R X. And we have some calibration data. We cross this here. Notice also that the calibration data might be noisy. We might be dealing with concentrations that are so low that our detector can just about see them, in which case each individual point will also have a random scatter. Of course, an attempt to do a slope estimation like this fail because the slope changes wildly if you were to just connect this with um, straight lines. So clearly this is some kind of linear dependence that passes through this cloud of points in some sense in an optimal way. And the cloud can be broad indeed, right? Particularly in things like social sciences where you cannot do too many experiments. Um, that's a typical situation. Let us think about what constitutes a good fit as opposed to a bad fit here. Well, a good fit is a fit that in some sense tries to pass through as many points or as near to as many points as is reasonably possible. So the distance between the line and the point is, is in a sense a measure. So let's take a vertical distance here, for example. So we have distance from here to here and distance from there to there and this little distance and that little distance and so on. And it stands to reason that the fit that has minimal total distance is a good fit. And if the line is completely out, the total distance will be big and that's going to be a bad fit. Now, of course, what we should take is not the use the distances because they're positive and negative, they might compensate each other, but the absolute or perhaps the square of the total. So let us pick up as a measure of the goodness of our fit the sum of squares of this distance. So our fidelity functional, and here I start to refer to the previous lecture, for y equals a x plus b. And here, y's and x's are fixed because they're experimental measurements, but a and b are variables because they control the line. So this goodness of fit will be a function actually of A and B. It will be the sum total over all experimental points, sum over N. It will be the distance between the actual experimental measurement and the result that is predicted by this line. So I will number these points. They will be x and y n point pairs numbered by n x1 y1 x2 y2 so basically concentration one absorbance one concentration two absorbance two and so on so we need the difference between the experimentally measured absorbance y n and the absorbance returned by our line at the corresponding concentration a, X, N, X, B, and we want the sum of squares. This in mathematics is called the error function. If this number is small, then we have a good fit, because the distance is small. If this number is larger, this number is, the worse is the fit. In principle, you can imagine some extraordinarily bad fits uh, that would drive this to a very large number, perhaps, opinion. 
in the language of the previous lecture, we have an optimization problem. We need to find a minimum of this with respect to the two parameters. Now, what you see here is differences, squares, and the sum of squares. So the sum of squares has to be the smallest possible number. Hence, the name of the method is called the least squares. And all of you must have come across this phrase in the past, although you might not necessarily have now what it actually is. OK. Let's use what I have done in the previous lecture and remember the condition for a stationary point. This, a minimum or a maximum. Well, the condition was that all partial derivatives of that had to be zero. So d omega by a must be zero and the d omega by t b must also be zero. Well, why don't we just do it? Simply calculate those derivatives, put them to zero, and see if we can extract the corresponding a's and b's. Okay, so d omega by t a is going to be differentiation is linear, so the sum just remains sum over n of the square. So two one n minus a minus and we are differentiating with respect to a, so that is the derivative of the outside function. Derivative of the inside function with respect to a is going to be minus x n. Minus x n. And that is our derivative. The same goes for b. d omega bar d b will be a sum remains change. Then again we are differentiating the square. So 2 y n minus a minus n minus b. And then the derivative of the inside with respect to b is just minus 1. So minus here and not much else. Must be 0. Must be 0. Okay, well, a sum of um, some terms um, looks like equations. These are equations for A and B. Um, looks like pretty horrible equations, which is why you always need a computer for this. But uh, let's <coughs> massage this a little bit more to see if we can make sense of this. Well, the first thing I'll do is I'll drop the minus 2 because minus 2 in both cases is an overall multiplier. And so we don't particularly care if it's equal to 0 anyway. And then I will split up this sum. So it will be a sum over n of y n x n. Then minus a x n squared. And then minus b x n. Zero, and then here at the bottom we will have a sum over n y and minus a x n and then minus equals okay let us split this up and take a's and b's out of the sum this will be sum y and x n minus a sum x squared minus b sum x n equals zero. All the sums are over our experimental data points. At the bottom here, it's a sum over n y n minus a sum over x n and then minus b but it will be just n instances of b b plus b plus b plus b plus b and basically that's just the b times the number of experimental points which we will call big m equals zero where this big m 
Okay, well, forbidding as this might look, this is actually a fairly simple system of linear equations for A and B. We can rewrite this slightly <coughs> further. What I'll do is I'll move that over there and multiply the whole thing by minus 1. So what we will have is A sum over N and plus b sum over n uh, xn equals uh, should be xn squared here uh, sum over n x n that's the first equation and then the second equation is going to be a sum over m x m plus b m equals sum of y m. Even though this looks pretty large, notice that the coefficients in front of a and b are actually trivial numbers. Summing up all of your coordinates, uh, concentrations, is easy. Right? So that's basically the sum of all concentrations in all these points. Not a hard thing to do, right? At that point, this becomes a number. M is the total number of experimental points, triviality. Summing up the squares of all concentrations, not a problem, right? Summing up all observances across a complete data set, Summing up the products of concentrations and absorbances, well, you'd have to push a few buttons on the calculator, but ultimately not a problem. At which point, you have a system of two equations for two unknowns, and it's nothing special. And it also uh, pairs of equations for pairs of unknowns. So what we can simply do is do exactly that, so just solve them. So what I can do is, for example, express B out here and substitute there and solve it for A. And let me just write that down. So we have A, and then we can discuss that expression and sum. And I will use a different index because there will be products of this sum. So previously I was summing over N, I will be now summing over K and J. Sum over K, X, K minus. J, J, and then sum K, K, divided by M, sum over K, X, K squared minus sum over K, X, K overall squared. So once again, the individual contributions to this horrible expression are actually very simple. There's nothing complicated about calculating this. Or that, or that, or that, or that, and you know the number of points at which point you have the A. And the B is simple in your handout. So if you are a computer trying to draw a straight line, through a series of points, you would not, of course, do any drawing under the bonnet. What you would do instead is obtain the two coefficients of, um, involved in the equation of that line, and then you will get the A and B out. The upside here is there is no possibility of human error. There is no human discretion involved which can also be a problem in high pressure situations. And of course, the task of summing up, perhaps a few dozen numbers, can be completed in microseconds. Even your computers inside your pockets, inside your phones, uh, do billions of multiplications per second these days. And so these sorts of calculations are nearly reasonable. 
Of course, we are not limited to the equation being a straight line. In principle, instead of the linear graph, we could have substituted an exponential, uh, or a one over, or a log, or anything we like. Uh, but in that case, the procedure would be a non-linear squares, and we would not have been able to solve these equations quite so simply. So they are simple because we had assumed the linear function. If we had tried a quadratic or an exponential, these equations would have been irrational or even transcendental. And then, of course, difficulties mount, but non-linear fitting is also something a computer can do. So this is what happens inside Microsoft Excel when you are drawing a straight line with three points. I would discourage you from using Excel, by the way. It is horrible. A uh, university has a site license for Origin, which is a professional statistical analysis software package, which will not only estimate you the A and B, but also the standard deviation, that is the measure of error in A and B, which is very important for risk analysis. For example, if you're doing something chemical, you'd want to know the probability of it blowing up. And if the probability is high, maybe it's not such a good idea. So knowing uncertainties in these quantities is important, right? If your pressure is you know, 10 atmospheres, it's one thing. But if it's 10 atmospheres plus or minus 100, that is a very different thing. So origin is going to give you also the measure of error in the parameters that you have. Uh, OK, so let us now go back to chemistry and uh, look through a very typical scenario of how to use these things. So for example is B, C, A, plus A. Uh, and this is one of the very typical protein assays that you will see, the other one is Bradford assay. Uh, and that's to do with the fact that uh, a protein by itself, all 20 amino acids in it, uh, are not, but is not particularly good at absorbing light. So the only functional groups in a protein that do uh, are tryptophan, uh, tyrosine, uh, histidine, uh, and phenylalanine, and they unfortunately absorb in the far ultraviolet, uh, like 200 nanometers. Also, and that's inconvenient because plenty of other things in biology also absorb that. And when you are trying to do the concentration measurement, uh, it is generally a good idea to shift the concentrate, to shift the absorbance maximum somewhere into the visible. So, basically, you take a protein, you take a reagent, for example, in hydrogen, uh, it is uh, a nitrogen containing substance that binds, I don't remember what it binds, I think, I mean, groups. Uh, and makes a strongly covered heterosegment. So whereas this was previously not covered, either of them, uh, we get the substance that is covered. So absorbs, in this case, in the red. typical table of spectrophotometric measurements. So what we do uh, in an experiment like that is first uh, we build that calibration data. Now an important thing about that calibration is that you need to have an estimate of where your point is. So let's say here if we put some numbers around this graph Let's say that's a point one molar concentration of some absorbing substance. 0.2.3 and so on, 2, 3, 4, 5 to 0.5 molar. And we build the corresponding absorbance system. How likely are you to have a 0.5 molar protein in your solution? Source. 
Right, so to first years, this would not be immediately obvious, uh, because one has to remember the typical molecular mass for a protein, right? About 20,000 uh, photons. So um, 20,000 grams, 20 kilograms per mole. Uh, and so an attempt to you know, get 10 kilograms of protein into a liter of water is, is unlikely to be successful, right? not, not here on Earth. And so it is quite clear that you need to at least have a rough idea about which concentrations your calibration must refer to. I mean, in the hypothetical case that we are an alien super civilization with high pressure it's able to cram that much protein into that much water. Uh, of course, then when you start measuring your actual thing, right, your concentrations are going to be here, and you would never be able to accurately quantify anything. It's just too close to zero. So uh, the estimates, the, the real estimates for concentrations of proteins are of the order of 0.1 millimole. Right, so a thousand times. And then, of course, that is the sort of realistic thing, 20 grams per liter, that you would have for a protein. And then, when you actually measure your absorbance, it will be somewhere in the middle of your calibration set, and it is possible to do it. The second thing that you will have to deal with that goes beyond the mathematics that I have formally described here is the fact that equipment has sensitivity. Uh, or in a more rigorous language, dynamic weights. So we've just considered the issue of your x-axis. Let's consider the issue of your y-axis. That is your absorbance. And that's the logarithm of how much was emitted versus how much was absorbed. So let's say typical absorbance in the red of a typical strongly colored um, substance um, at the concentration, so let's say copper sulfate, about one molar, so dark, dark blue, uh, will put the absorbance at L equals one centimeter, much bigger than four. What that means is with decimal logarithms that four orders of magnitude have been shaped of the intensity of the light. So the light that's coming out is a factor of 10,000 less intense than the light that's coming in. Now you can probably see what the problem is going to be here. Realistic equipment that is at least built into the chip spectrophotometers used in biological research simply would not be able to detect that quantity of light. It's too weak. What will in fact happen is this noise will go through the roof relative to the intensity, the accuracy is going to deteriorate in the situation even when you're able to detect anything to begin with. And so not only must we worry about the realistic range of concentrations, we must also worry about the physical limits of the detection equipment that might not be able the light that's coming out. Right? There, to be fair, there is equipment in physics, um, photomultiplier tubes and so on, that can detect single photons. And they're used in various high pressure situations, uh, like radioactivity measurement, where you really want to detect that one decayed atom, particularly if you're discovering something at the edge of the periodic table, uh, but not in the not in the typical spectrum. So the range of absorbances in here, realistic an instrument must go from zero, where nothing is getting absorbed, right? The law of one is zero, to about three. So a factor of a thousand decay, the light intensity motor equipment can actually tolerate, uh, but not the factor of 10,000 or more. So you need to worry about these concentrations. And once you've established your concentration range, you need to worry about absorbances. Now, what happens if the two requirements collide? That is, the concentrations that you expect, there are some pretty strongly colored substances out there, um, D element complexes, like that. I mean, copper sulfate is okay, but you take some 
amino complex of a copper, like with ethyldiamine, whatever it is, uh, that will be the bluest thing you've ever seen. It will be real blue. And so it will absorb red light like there's no tomorrow. So even at the concentrations that you intend to do, in that case, the correct course of action is to dilute both the unknown sample and the calibration sample. So you receive some unknowns, it's colored too strongly, the correct thing is to pop it into a bottle of water, dilute it until your spectrophotometer can cope, re-estimate the concentration in the diluted substance, rebuild the calibration set, get the concentration into the diluted substance, and then calculate that the dilution factor, what's the concentration in the original substance. Okay, so that is um, the practical considerations uh, regarding instruments. Let's take a closer look now at the practical considerations uh, about the signal to noise ratio. So if we draw another graph, so this is x and this is y. And you do the calibration as students do. Uh, and you get your wonderful calibration data set that looks roughly like this. So a beautiful spherical cloud of points. Uh, now, whatever line we draw through this, how likely is it to be correct? Probably not. Because <coughs> It may depend on your concentration like this, it may depend on your concentration like that, it may depend on it like that. In all three cases, the final error functional is going to be similar. That is why it is rather important to use the software that returns you an error estimate on A and B, rather than just A and B. So you need and we will cover that in a few lectures time, A plus minus the standard deviation of A and B plus minus the standard deviation of B. And if these error parameters are bigger than the values themselves, that is probably not a good idea. So always uh, be aware of extremely low quality. The other thing that often happens is people would get their data set X, Y, and it will have a lot of pretty lines, and then it will do that. Now, it is obvious that somebody just mixed up the label on the substances. That is, the zero concentration ended up being counted as the max concentration. Step. If you mindlessly plonk it down the software, what will happen is that quadratic error functional will go haywire. What it will say, okay, if I try and draw the correct line here, then this distance is enormous. The square of that distance is even bigger. In order to minimize the distance, what the program will do is it will draw a line like that, which of course is way out. So this is something that a human would catch if a human does it on a millimeter paper. But if you do it like this, if you just put it into a computer without plotting and just run the least squares, without looking at the data and doing a common sense check on it, then unfortunately this automatic procedure will do exactly what it was intended to do and minimize the sum squared of the distances with the result that your pitted line would probably not have much to do with the line that should have been there. So again, later in this course, we will deal with the issue of these so-called outlier points, which are just clearly down uh, to experimental errors. How do you detect, how to eliminate, how to use statistical analysis? Okay, so that is, um, I think, all I wanted to say today. You will have some examples of very, very high quality statistical analysis in your handout uh, for, for the BCA assay in particular. Uh, the data set that are in your handout, you will be using these data sets in your class later today. 
to do your own distance squares analysis of these things. There are some unknown samples that you will determine the concentrations of. Um, and I think that's the part. The last topic that we need to cover, and I still have the five minutes, is the situations where the function we are fitting isn't actually linear. Plenty of physical laws in reality that are not straight lines. Consider the example of, well, let's do first the radioactive decay. You know it's an expansion. So let's say we have the number of atoms was the number of atoms at some starting point, E minus kT, where k is the radioactive rate of decay. Well, not a line, right? If we put it into here, well, technically speaking, we know how to differentiate expansions. It will be lovely until the very last point where we will have to solve the equation, which will end up being unsolvable because it's a transcendental equation involving an expansion. So, bit of a problem. What people normally do is they linearize. Is they find a mathematical transformation of this that makes the curve linear. And we actually did this already here, though. I kind of cast it into the elaborate form on grounds of convenience, but it's not just convenience, it's also the fact that linear is squares doesn't really away from linear functions. So let's take the log. Take the log and log and zero minus kt. Where I can take the logs this way because m is actually dimensionless, right? In the case of radioactive decay, it's just a number of the atoms. Here I have to be careful to put a dimensionless quantity. Up there, I don't. And notice that that's actually a straight line. Right. If I plot the log of the atoms um, against time, it's a linear relationship. So, and then that can be standard procedure. Let's consider first order, uh, second order chemical kinetics. So, if we have something like that, the concentration will depend on time. As a plus ct, so one over dependence, and uh, again just plotting it uh, like that will result in a hyperbola, which we will then have certain difficulty solving for, although not as much difficulty as the exponential distribution to be solved, just not straightforward. Well, why don't we just take one over of this? Uh, 1 over c of t, hoping that the concentration is not going to be 0 or close to 0, uh, and then that is b plus c t over a, which is b over a plus c over t, which is again a linear curve. So if we plot 1 over concentration against time, we will be able to determine the two coefficients by the linear distance squares procedure, and then hopefully uh, we can solve it for the individual A, B, and C once we've got their combinations. And I think the last example I've got is of a quadratic curve. So if Y is A x square plus 1, then again, nonlinear, not terribly nonlinear, but kind of nonlinear in an unpleasant way. Well, move 1 over here, divide by a takes the square root. So y minus 1 divided by a root is x. Uh, and um, in this case, one occasionally needs to worry about the positive and the negative branches of the solution. Because depending on the physical meaning of what you're dealing with, negative values of x may or may not be permitted. Um, if x is concentration, obviously not. If x is time, why not? <coughs> Something happened in the past. And so this again relies to an extent on, on your common sense um, uh, as you are doing all of this. Okay, so the summary of the lecture is the linear least squares and non-linear least squares as well is something you will be doing till retirement as professional chemists. It is ubiquitous in data processing and analysis, absolutely everywhere. Uh, I'm doing computational chemistry for a living. Uh, you know, last time I've been in the lab it was 10 years ago, and even I have to deal with this every day. 
the way to proceed is not the way that we are doing in school, but the way that grown-ups and computers do it, that is to declare an error functional with respect to your target function. Uh, and one of the most convenient ways of doing it is the least squares method, when you minimize the sum of the squares of the distance. By now, we know exactly how to minimize it. You put partial derivatives to zero. This is exactly what we did. We got that. We solved for the stationary points. A much longer story is about estimating the second derivatives and here and plugging it in to make sure it's actually a minimum. But since the curve is quadratic, you know that the quadratic curve only has one minimum, and so it's kind of redundant in this particular case. So the one uh, extreme we have found uh, for a situation where you have uh, a positive leading coefficient necessarily uh, has to be a minimum. So this has to be a minimum. And this is how the computer has it. There are multiple caveats to data processing. One is having a horrible quality calibration data set. Always insist that the program returns you the standard deviations of the parameters that it has calculated. And the second is mixing up the labels in the data set, resulting in major outliers. Unfortunately, this method does exactly as it's told. Uh, and if something's way out, it will do its down at this job of a data set. Distance is resulting in a new erroneous conclusion. So, apply a measure of common sense before using the data that comes out. Any questions? 